to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke chapter 19, verse number 10. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Christ is a worldwide evangelistic program that's being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, please visit our website thegospelofchrist.com. All our material is free of charge. We'll send that to you free of charge and we'll even pay the shipping to get it there. As we think today about Luke's message in those final chapters in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapters 17 through 24, we now see everything coming to a climax in Jesus' life as He prepares to shed His blood and die for humanity. Luke chapter 17, Jesus reminds us of what our real duty is in this life. Are we doing it because we ought to? Are we doing it because we're forced to? No, but Jesus does illustrate each of us has a duty to God. Luke 17, 10 says it this way, So likewise you, when you've done all those things commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Can I really beat my own chest and say, look at what I've done, how great I am, I'm such a great servant of God. No, at my best, here's what I can say. I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that, which was my duty to do. What makes us unprofitable? Sin does. Sin causes us to be separated from God. Sin causes us to be stained with iniquity. Sin brings death and reproach, and, and God cannot look upon that. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. We're unprofitable servants. We've only done that, which was our duty to do. I have both the privilege and the duty to serve God and to live faithfully to Him and to honor Him and to be thankful in everything I do. But you know, sometimes... People aren't often as thankful as they ought to be. Let me give you an illustration from Luke 17. About verses 11 through 18, Jesus relates a story of ten lepers. Those lepers came to Jesus imploring Him to heal them of this dreaded disease of which there was no cure available at the time. Jesus heals them, tells them to go their way, show themselves to the priest, make the offering. They do that. All ten of them are cleansed. One man came back and gave thanks to God. And do you remember Jesus' haunting question in Luke 17, 17? Scripture says, So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? You know what a haunting question that is that reminds us, I need to be thankful to God. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 17 through 21 teaches us, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I ought to be thankful, ought to praise God, ought to honor Him, ought to approach His throne in prayer and give Him the glory He deserves. You know, when we think about times like Thanksgiving, that's just not a one-day event. That ought to be every day for the child of God. Here's why. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. For the Christian, every day ought to be a day of thanksgiving to God Almighty. And one of the ways that we show our thanksgiving is through prayer. And Jesus taught us about the power of prayer in Luke 18.1. Friend, let me ask you, do you ever get discouraged? 
Do you ever get down? Does life ever throw you a curveball that maybe you're just not ready for? How do you deal with that, spiritually speaking? Look at Jesus' powerful words. I hope you'll never forget this. Luke 18, 1, Then Jesus spoke a parable to them, saying, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. How do you keep from really getting discouraged and giving up? Prayer has powerful results. James 5 verse 16, men ought always to pray. Don't give up. Don't give in. Instead, we ought to approach the throne of grace where we can find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Hebrews 4 verse 16. Instead of letting our faith get down, we ought to, James 1 verse 5, as it says, get down on our hands and knees and pray to God who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to Him. And so utilize the power of prayer in the Christian's life. But you know, to first pray to God, you've got to have the right mindset and the right heart and the humility of spirit that an individual needs. I want you to notice an example of that in Luke chapter 18, beginning about verse number 10. The Scripture says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. And here's Jesus' point. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Can you imagine the audacity of this Pharisee? I give tithes of all that. I fast twice a week. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other men. Thank you that I'm not like this wicked tax collector. And don't you know how good it is? I am on your side. What a, a pious, prideful, an ungodly attitude that man had. Now, you contrast that with the tax collector. Who was not really in the class of the righteous? What did he do? He knew he was wrong, knew he needed God's help, and with humility of heart said, God, I need you. One man said, God, you need me, and you ought to be thanking me. I'm on your side. Another man said, God, I need you, and thank you that you've spared me this long. Jesus said, whoever exalts himself, that's the man who's going to be humbled. Whoever humbles himself, that's the man who's going to be exalted. And so let's put our trust and faith in God and let's have the humility of heart and mind to really acknowledge we need God and we desperately need His grace in our lives. Now, in Luke chapter 19, verse number 10, we kind of see the, the mission and the mindset of Jesus coming to a climax. In Luke 19, 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Directly on the heels of discussing with Zacchaeus about the kingdom, about how glad he was that it came to, to his house and his town, Jesus in essence says, that's my mission. That's what it's all about. The Son of Man, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. Well, let's ask a few questions relative of Jesus' statement. First, I need to know, and men and women need to know, what is that which is lost? Humanity, mankind, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23, none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 verse 10. As a result of that sin, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 23. That soul who sins will surely die. Ezekiel 18 4. What was lost? All men everywhere because of their sin, because of their choices, and because of wrong that we've done in our life. Now let's ask a second question. What did God do 
to stop that sin problem. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus left the beauty of heaven, came to this earth. He, he, he lived a perfect life gave Himself as a sacrifice on the cross so that we could overcome the sin problem. Remember 1 Peter 2 verse 24. The Bible says of Jesus, He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. When Jesus is is mocked, when he's beaten, when he's spit upon, when a crown of thorns is placed in his head, when, when stripes are brought over his back time and time again, and, and when ultimately Christ hangs on that cross and dies in agony. Why did he do that? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Look at what Jesus, look at the lengths and the depths Jesus went to to seek and save that which is lost. He sought it so much that He gave His own life up for every man and woman who would be obedient to the gospel of Christ. God wants all men to be saved. First Timothy 2 verse 4, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3 verse number 16. But you know, to this great sacrifice and to this gift, some were not appreciative at all. In fact, the religious leaders of Jesus' day saw His life and His teaching as a great threat. So much so that they were always looking for an opportunity to catch Jesus. Notice, for example, Luke chapter 20, verse number 20. The scripture says, Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be honest, hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. You know, when I think about Christ and the good that He did, not everybody really appreciated that. Some people were threatened by Jesus. His authority and His power would only take away their authority and their power. Those who were living in sin and knew it, they didn't like Jesus' message. Those who were prideful of themselves, they didn't want to hear a message about humility and for into a world that is often so wrapped up and tangled up in itself, many people today don't want to hear a message about Jesus. This is why so many humanistic theories exist. Man is the center of his universe. Man needs to be coddled. Man needs all the things that will make him happy. Friend, we don't need all that. We need Jesus. Let's put aside any pretenses. Let's be willing to be honest with ourselves, and let's realize Jesus has the answers to the questions of life. Now, in this context, you've already heard, here are people who are looking to catch Jesus in His words. They don't like His authority. They've sent people who out there are faking it, pretending to be honest, trying to catch Jesus. They're going to pose questions at Him. They're going to throw scenarios at Him. And yet it still doesn't work. For we record these words, where we hear these words in Luke 20, verse number 40. But after that, after they tried pretty much everything they could think of, after that, they dared not question Him anymore. They'd already had egg on their face way too many times when they tried to question Jesus. They'd already been pointed back to the Scriptures and not necessarily just rebuked by Jesus, but their own Scriptures had rebuked them too many times. And so what did they do? They didn't question Him anymore. They're through questioning. They're through trying to catch Jesus. They're through trying to outsmart or outwit Him. There's only one option left. Let's kill Him. And from this point forward, that's what they began to plot to do. But you know, as I think about these words, Luke chapter 20, verse number 40, what a great encouragement this gives to the child of God. Jesus' greatest enemies of the day finally gave up questioning Him because 
He had the right answers. They dared not question him anymore. They knew Jesus would, through logic, through common sense, and through the scriptures, through this book, give them the answer that they weren't ready to hear. Friend, the good news is this. Jesus and His Word does have the answer. I can ask the right question. I can come to God and reason with Him. Isaiah 1 verse 18. I can study my Bible. I can seek to prove all things. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21. And, and this book has the answers that we need. Let's not be afraid of those answers. Let's be encouraged by them and try to do everything by the authority and the will of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, a powerful lesson that we learn from a lady who many probably didn't even know of in the day of Jesus, a lesson that will last throughout eternity. Now we learn about true giving from the mind of Jesus and His example here. Look at Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. He looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all, for all these out of their abundance have put in offering for God, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, put in her whole livelihood. You know, when I think about this widow, here Jesus, and it's interesting what He's doing. He's watching how people are giving. Friend, that right there ought to give us a little pause, make us think. God knows our motive. He knows not only what we do, but how we do it. Jesus is watching the rich as they put their gifts in the treasury, and He's watching how they give it. Well, how might they give it? Someone who's rich, everybody's going to be watching. And when that man dumps his gift in, they're going to be impressed with the great noise that it makes, with how much money he put in. And, and he's looking for that show and he's seeing what others are looking at as well. Jesus is watching how they do it, why they do it, what's their motivation. And then can you imagine the contrast? All the rich come through and their money in the bucket makes a big noise. And then that poor widow doesn't have anybody to provide for her. She's left to herself. Two mites, clink, clink, in the bucket. And can't you imagine how those people who are watching probably began to snicker at the little bit of money that this widow put in? Why didn't she even come today? If all she had was two mites, why didn't she stay home? Why didn't she wait till she got a little more to give? It wasn't even worth her trip here. And yet what did Jesus say? That poor widow, she put in more than all the rich. Why? They gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her livelihood all that she had. You know, some people, they give out of the excess. They give out of the abundance. They give what's left over. Not this woman. She trusted in God, was so appreciative of God, put her faith in God so much that she gave those two mites and it was everything she had. She dumped out the whole piggy bank. She closed out the bank account. She didn't give out of the excess. She gave it all to God. What was she going to eat tomorrow? I don't know. How was she going to survive? How was she going to pay the bills? Those weren't questions she was concerned with. My friends, this is a powerful lesson about really seeking first the kingdom of God. Jesus talks about in Matthew 6, the subject of worry and anxiety and all the things that go along with that. And he kind of puts it all in perspective about food, shelter, clothing, how we're going to know God's going to provide for us. He says this, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If I put God and His kingdom first, the Lord's going to take care of me. Everything's going to be well. I can have the tranquility and peace of knowing that myself, my family, those whom I love, if we're striving to do God's will, put the kingdom first, all else will be taken care of. But we must be on guard against Satan and his temptation. Simon wasn't quite as ready as he thought he was. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 31, Simon often likes to brag and to boast. Even if everybody else leaves you, Lord, I'm not going to leave you. 
Luke 22, verse 31, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But Jesus goes on to say, I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. You remember Simon's background in this chapter and a little bit more. Luke chapter 22, 23, here Simon says, I'll never deny you. Jesus says, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Simon said, oh no, not me. And then we hear that rooster crow. And we see Simon deny the Lord. Aren't you glad Jesus did pray for him? Aren't you glad that Jesus warned him? Aren't you glad that he realized he had messed up and came back to God? Friend, we need to realize that Satan is indeed an active adversary. We need to realize that his devices are indeed something that we've got to be on the alert about. He's like that roaring lion. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. He's that dragon. Revelation chapter 12. He's like that sly serpent that we find in Genesis 3. And I've got to be aware. He is actively and aggressively trying to tempt men and women to lose their own salvation and not put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Luke chapter 23, everything kind of comes to a climax. Jesus is now taken by evil men. This was all part of God's plan, but He's taken by evil men. Those evil men take Him to what we know of as the hall or the praetorium. There they begin to accuse Jesus, to question Him. They begin to mock Him, to, to spit upon Him. They place a crown of thorns. Long thorns are embedded in a, a crown and, and pressed into a skull. They beat Him with a rod, a staff. They then take Jesus and over and over again, Stripes are placed on his back. Jesus' arms are stretched tight. He's bent over something like into a post most likely or hung in an area where it would pull pressure on his back. And every time that stripe is brought across on his back, the muscle, the sinew, the, the, the flesh, it begins to tear and to bleed. Then Jesus is taken to Golgotha, the place of the skull, Calvary. There. His hands and His feet are nailed to a wooden cross. That cross is lifted up, just as Jesus said it would. In John chapter 12, I'll be lifted up for all men. That cross is lifted up. And there Jesus struggles for every breath. There He suffers the greatest pain and agony that we can begin to imagine. Why did He do that? Why did He suffer? Isaiah commented on this. In the long ago, He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. By His stripes we are healed. Why did Jesus give up His life? Why did He die without the shedding of blood? There's no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And the Bible says in Hebrews 10, verse 12, This man, Jesus, after He'd offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus gave all that up. He died. He suffered. He made the ultimate sacrifice so that we could go to heaven. Do you remember Matthew 26, 28? As Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, the Scripture says, Jesus took and passed around the fruit of the vine, and He said, This is My blood of the new covenant, which was shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus made that ultimate sacrifice so that we could have the hope of heaven. Now, it doesn't end there at the cross, though. And it doesn't end at the tomb that they laid Jesus in. Yes, they put Him in a tomb. Yes, they rolled a stone over it. But Luke 24 records for us the great event of the resurrection. Those stone walls, that humongous stone that was laid in front of the, the tomb where Jesus was, they couldn't contain Him, as Christians often sing. Up from the grave, He did arise. On that first day of the week, Jesus arose from the grave. He presented Himself to His disciples, to other witnesses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in one example, in Luke 24, verse 32, He presents Himself to two men on the road to Emmaus. Watch what happens in Luke 24, verse 32. Did not our heart burn within us 
while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. You talk about heartburn. Here's a case of spiritual heartburn. These people are wondering about the events that happen. They're wondering about Jesus, and, and Jesus begins to show them this is what had to happen. He opens up the Scripture. He talks with them along the way, and that fire that was there begins to burn. It begins to kindle. They, they still have that fire for God, and a good case of spiritual heartburn occurs with these folks. And then in Luke chapter 24, Verses 44 through 49, appearing to His own disciples, Jesus tells them, You wait in Jerusalem till you receive power from on high. There you'll be My witnesses. And right here in this scene is where Acts chapter 1 picks up. They're waiting in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit comes. Peter, along with the other apostles, stands up and for the very first time preaches the good news about Jesus, that He is the Lord and Savior of all men. Acts 2 verse 36, This Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. And the Bible says they got the point. They were cut to the heart and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 42 tells us, Those who gladly received their word were baptized. And verse 47, The Lord added daily to the church those who were saved. Look at the, the powerful message. Jesus' death, His burial, His resurrection, the gospel being preached. Men and women for the first time as a present reality received immediate, not sins that were rolled back, immediate remission of sins through the blood of Jesus. Friend, did you know that can be yours today? If you'll obey the gospel, if you'll become a Christian, if you'll repent of sin and be immersed, you can have that same joy and hope that Jesus came to give. He came to seek and save the lost. Let's let Him by obeying the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost He'll souls, not like your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.